Good evening, church. Thanks for tuning in and joining me uh, this Christmas Eve. And we've gathered together now to exalt Jesus Christ. And I want to do that uh, by looking to him in the scriptures. So if you have a copy of God's word, and I hope you do, uh, now's the time to pick them up and open them up with me to John chapter 16. Uh, John 16. And as you're finding uh, John 16 in your Bibles, let me welcome everyone to part three in a Christmas series entitled Gifts Jesus Gives. Gifts Jesus Gives. Uh, my family and I have a, a wonderful Christmas Eve tradition. We, we open up one gift. And that's exactly what we want to do this evening. We want to open up just one gift that Jesus came to give us at Christmas. And that gift is found for us under our tree, uh, John 16. But before we do, I want to ask you a question. The question is this, what is your all-time favorite Christmas movie? Do you have one? Maybe for some of you ladies watching, that movie is White Christmas or, or Miracle on 34th Street. Maybe for some of you men, that movie is Die Hard or, or The Christmas uh, Story. Maybe for some of you teens watching, uh, it's Home Alone or Christmas with the Cranks. Maybe for any of you kids who may be watching, that movie is The Polar Express or The Grinch. What is your favorite Christmas movie. Well, I love all Christmas movies, especially the classics. I love all the old school Christmas characters that reappear on TV each and every year. Matter of fact, real quickly, here are the top five classic Christmas movie characters. Are you ready? The top five uh, Christmas movie characters of all time. Here they come. Uh, rounding out our top five is none other than Rudolph in his bright red nose. Uh, coming in at number four is the mean green fighting machine, the Grinch. Standing tall at number three is Kevin McAllister from Home Alone. Number two on our list is none other than Ralphie in his Red Rider BB gun. And the number one greatest Christmas character of all time, the goat of all Christmas movies is, are you ready? A uh, drum roll, please. Buddy the Elf. Have you ever seen the movie Elf? Elf has quickly become a holiday classic and has won the hearts of so many. It's a hilarious and heartwarming story all centered around the lovable main character, Buddy. We quickly learn that Buddy is no ordinary elf. Matter of fact, Buddy's not an elf at all. He's actually a human who was raised in an elves world. But one day, a Buddy discovers the truth. He, he learns his true identity and immediately a Buddy feels empty. Like something in his life is missing. You see, what Buddy was missing, what, what, Buddy, was, what Buddy was wanting and needing was a father, a father, a, a family. Well, Buddy finds out from his caregiver, Papa Elf, that he in fact has a father. His name is Walter, he, he lives in New York City. So in order to fill that void in his heart, in order to find what was missing, Buddy goes on a journey. He leaves the North Pole and he travels through the seven levels of the candy cane forest and through the sea of swirly, twirly gumdrops. Then he walked through the Lincoln Tunnel into New York City, all to find and bond with his long lost father. Now, yes, the movie Elf is hilarious, but the moral of the story is actually quite serious. You see, the moral is this. Everyone needs father love. Everyone needs father love. Matter of fact, the screenwriter, David Berenbaum, gives, gives us the story behind the movie. Uh, he said this in a recent interview with Netflix. The movie Elf was inspired by the death of my dad. He passed away when I was really young. 
And so I never really had a, a loving father figure in my life. So, so Buddy's story is really my story. And the emotional drive of the movie is really searching for the father I never had. And then he said this, in a way, we are all like Buddy. We are all wanting and searching for a father who will love us. See, the truth is this, there exists a hunger for father love in every human heart. Everyone longs for a satisfying father experience. Everyone needs a father figure that can give them what their heart so desperately need. Love, affection, protection, wisdom, guidance, support, encouragement. You see, the need for father love is universal. Well, why is that? I mean, where does this hunger come from? Why is there this void in all of our hearts? Well, it's because you and I were created for a relationship with a heavenly Father. We were made to know and to love and to enjoy the glory of God. God says in Isaiah 43, 7, I created you for my glory. Acts 17, 28 tells us that in God we live and move and have our being. So you see, we were created to live in fellowship with a perfect, holy, loving God. That's why we exist. For intimacy with God. To know and to love God and to be known and loved by Him. And that's exactly the kind of relationship our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, enjoyed. They walked and talked with God. They were loved and protected and supported and encouraged by their maker. Every longing was filled. Every need was met. They existed in perfect fellowship with God. It was paradise. However, all of that changed in Genesis chapter 3. The darkest day in history, the day Adam and Eve chose to sin against God. God gave them one simple rule and they failed to obey. And as a result, paradise was now polluted. Sin and death entered our world and infected the human race. Everything was now cursed. And because God is sinless and Adam and Eve were now sinful, they were separated from God. They were no longer able to live in the garden. That relationship they were made for was now broken. They were broken. And it wasn't God's fault. It was ours. Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people, because all have sinned. So you see, thanks to our first ancestors, we are all now born broken in sin. We have sin natures, which is why we all choose to sin. And it's our sin that separates us from God. And that's why the Bible says we must and will die. Now please understand, there are two kinds of death. There's physical death. This is the first death. This is the power of the grave, a tombstone, a cemetery, a casket. But there is a second death. This is far worse. This is the punishment of hell, the eternal suffering and separation from God forever in the lake of fire. Romans 20, 14 says that the lake of fire, hell, is the second death. So the truth is, we're all broken sinners, fallen creatures, and our sin separates us from God now. But it's, it's sin's penalty, death, that will separate us from God forever. And that's why we're all born with this void in our hearts, this emptiness in our lives, this need for acceptance and approval. Like Buddy, we all have this hunger for Father love. And trust me, nothing in this world can fill that void. No one can give you the acceptance and, and satisfy that longing for father love in your soul. Only God can. 
As St. Augustine once said, God has made us for himself. And our hearts will always be restless until they find their rest in him. Well, thankfully, that rest is possible. And it was made available for us at Christmas. Jesus, the Son of God, became a man and died in the place of sinners so that sinners like us could become sons of God. Jesus was born to fill that void, to bring us to God, to gift us with what our hearts are all longing for, Father, love. And notice this precious gift beginning in verse 25 of our passage. Jesus here is just moments from death. Soon, uh, Jesus is going to accomplish for us the purpose for why he came. The cross is looming, and so Jesus wants to prepare his disciples for what's coming. It, it's kind of like a, a rough road sign. Ever seen one of those? A sign that says, rough road ahead? Well, that's exactly what Jesus is about to say to his disciples. Buckle up. A rough road is coming, and I must walk this road so that you can be reconciled to God. I must suffer for you so that you can be saved from your sins. Notice what Jesus says in verse 25. These things, these things refers to the rough road that's, that lies ahead. His betrayal, his torture, his death. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. The words figurative language could really be translated as veiled sayings or mysteries. You see, up to this point, Jesus has spoken openly about his death, but, but most often he's done so in veiled ways, with illustrations or uh, analogies. For example, in John chapter 2, after Jesus cleanses the temple, he says these words, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What's Jesus talking about? How can you rebuild a temple in three days? That's impossible. You see, Jesus isn't talking about a building, but his body. He's saying, I'm giving up my life in death, but in three days later, I'm going to take it back up again. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is speaking to a group of Pharisees, and he says this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will I, the Son of Man, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's Jesus saying? Is he just telling another embellished fish fishing story? No, what he's saying is, what he's saying is, is the story of his coming. I came to die. I came to be buried. I, I came to rise again. So again, time and time again, Jesus spoke of his death. He spoke of his resurrection, but he did so in these veiled ways, but he wouldn't always. Because notice what Jesus says next. But the time is coming when I will no longer use figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about my Father. Have you ever watched a movie and been completely confused until the end? I know I have, right? Once the ending comes, right, everything else, everything else that happens just makes sense, right? It all becomes clear. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Right now, this rough road that's coming, it, it doesn't make any sense, it's confusing. You, you don't understand it all. But when the road is over, when the movie ends, when it's all finished, when you look back at the cross, it will all make sense. You'll understand why I had to die, why I had to give up my life. Jesus continues. In that day, you will ask the Father on your behalf. Now, here it is. Here's the gift of Father love. For the Father himself, what does it say? Loves you. Some of you watching, that's exactly what you needed to hear tonight. The Father loves you. The word love is the Greek word agape. It means you before me. It's a love that sacrifices and it does so selflessly. In other words, it gives without expecting. 
It gives without wanting. It gives without needing anything in return. It's not manipulative. It comes with no conditions or expectations. You see, this is true, authentic, unconditional love. It's the choice to spend yourself and use yourself for the happiness of another person. Because your greatest joy is that person's joy. That's agape love. You see, God doesn't love by our rules. Sadly, today, when someone says, I love you, what they're really saying is, I love what you do for me. As long as you make me happy, I will love you. But when my needs are no longer being met, when my happiness is gone, so is my love. You see, the truth is, because we're all broken in sin, none of us are fully capable of this true love. In a way, all our love is somewhat fake. And that's because we all need to be loved like we need air and water. We can't live without love. And that's why we can't give love to anyone else. True love, unconditional love, because it's what we're all starving for. So whenever we invest our love, we are hoping and we are wanting, we are needing a good return. You see, only God can love without need. And that's because God exists in a love relationship with it himself. He is love. You see, God exists in three distinct yet equal persons. He's three in one. We call it the Trinity. There is God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And all three have been knowing and loving one another perfectly for all of eternity. Within himself, God has forever been knowing and loving perfectly. Within himself, God has forever had all the love, all the fulfillment, all the joy that he could possibly want. He is love, which is why God alone is fully capable of loving unconditionally. And Jesus says, the Father loves you. He loves you unconditionally. And if you doubt it, if you question it, if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, Christmas proves it. Christmas proves it. Out of a love for us, God sent Jesus to us. Jesus took our nature in a cradle in Bethlehem in order to die our death on a cross in Jerusalem. All so that we could be with him in heaven. God loves you. As John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 10 says, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Newsflash God loves you, and Christmas proves it, and Jesus gave his life so that you would have it and know it. But here's the question. How do you receive it? How can you be loved by God like Jesus? How do you become a, a precious child of God? How do you get your hands on this father love? Well, well, Jesus tells us. Look at verse 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and have what? What's the word? Believe that I came from the Father. And here's the message of Christmas. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. But again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's about Jesus coming as an infant, dying on a cross, rising from a tomb, ascending into heaven, and someday soon coming again. You see, Christmas is so much more than just a holy night or what child is this. It's also Jesus paid it all. Up from the grave he arose and coming again. That's Christmas. And because we have the Christmas story, we can now have an adoption story. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says this, But when the set time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's Christmas. 
Well, why did Jesus come? To redeem those who are under the law. Now listen, that we might receive the adoption of sonship. You see, God sent Jesus that first Christmas to adopt us, to make us family. But there was an adoption fee. A price needed to be paid for our sin, and, and we couldn't afford it. We couldn't pay it, but Jesus did. That's why he came at Christmas, to wrap himself in our sin and to bear our death. He came to be crucified on a criminal's cross so that sinners like us could be called children of God. He paid the fee in full with his life. As Jesus says, I came from the Father for you. And Jesus says, all you have to do to be part of God's family is believe. Believe. You see, you can't earn your adoption papers. You can't afford the adoption fee. But listen, Jesus has already earned it and paid it for you. And so all you have to do is receive it by faith. Believe in what Jesus has already done. Again, as Jesus says, the Father loves you because you have loved me. And I believed and, and, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. You see, our only hope for adoption, your only way to fill that void in your heart with Father love is Jesus. So let me ask you, are you loved? Are you a highly favored child of God? Or are you still lost and far from him? Have you turned from your sin and believed in Jesus? If not, why not sign those adoption papers today? Do it now because there may not be a later. But if you're watching and you've done that, then listen, your birth certificate now reads, child of God. God is your heavenly father. And get this, he loves you like he does Jesus. God looks at you and says what he said of Jesus. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. What a gift. Mothers are incredible. Mothers are irreplaceable. But there is nothing that can replace the need for father love. As Sigmund Freud once said, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's love, attention, and protection. George Herbert once said, one father is worth more than a hundred school teachers. But sadly, father absence has become a pandemic, an epidemic today. I could go on and on and tell you story after story after story of, of people, and not just young people, but people in their mid-30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s. People who lived their whole lives without a father, a loving person to play that role in their lives. And the truth is, people who don't have a father or who do, but they're cruel and abusive and, and, and absent, those individuals struggle. They struggle physically, they struggle emotionally, mentally, relationally. Uh, don't believe me? Then just listen to these staggering statistics. A recent survey found that sexuality and sexual confusion and early sexual involvement are more likely in adolescents from absent father homes. The same survey also found that children in absent father homes are five times more likely to be poor. 50% of children living in fatherless homes live in poverty. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all the children that exhibit behavioral disorders and chronic depression come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youths sitting in prisons today grew up in fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. What does this all mean? Well, it means that children from fatherless homes are five times more likely to commit suicide, 
seven times more likely to run away from home, 15 times more likely to have behavioral disorders and depression, 10 times more likely to be confused sexually or involved sexually, 15 times more likely to end up in prison while still a teenager. So all that to say this, the hunger for father love is universal. It's universal. And father absence has become an epidemic and it's destroying families and individuals all over our world. And maybe you're watching and you know very well about this epidemic. Maybe you've never had a dad or you did, but he was cruel and he was mean. He was abusive or always absent. Well, listen, I got great news of great joy just for you. Jesus came that first Christmas to heal that wound, to mend what's broken, to fill that void in your heart, to free you from all the pain and sorrow caused by your earthly father. Jesus gave his life as an adoption fee for you so that you can be a child of God so that you could have and know a father who is never absent, never abusive, never cruel, never condescending, never harsh, never hurtful. Instead, your heavenly father will always and only love you, protect you, provide for you, be present with you, be proud of you, delight in you, cherish you perfectly and eternally. He is an everlasting father. He's a father to the fatherless. And that gift of father love is waiting for you, but it's only found in Jesus. Well, maybe you're here, you're watching, and you had a great dad. Your dad was a wonderful man or a great grandfather or a father figure in your life, but that figure is now gone. He's passed away. And Christmas is hard. I mean, you, you feel that void again. You... Your heart breaks again. You, you miss him. Well, listen, thanks to Jesus, you have a heavenly father who will never leave you nor forsake you, who draws near to you in your pain. His name's Emmanuel, God with us. And he sees your pain. He tracks your tears. He keeps your tears in a bottle. And one day soon, your heavenly father is going to wipe away all your tears. You see, because Jesus came at Christmas, we can have a heavenly father who is always with us. And get this, soon and very soon, our heavenly father is going to send Jesus again. But this time, to bring home all his kids to be with him. As the old hymn says, when he comes, our glorious king, all his ransom home to bring. And then anew this song will sing, Alleluia, what a Savior. And all of that is ours because of the first Christmas. Because Jesus came from the Father, we can call God our Heavenly Father. We have Father love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for its significance. May we never lose the wonder of the fact that, God, you came in flesh. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And Jesus took our nature in a cradle in Bethlehem in order to die our death on a cross in Jerusalem so that we could be forgiven of our sin and found right with God. So that, God, we can move from being enemies of God to being children of God. So that, God, we can know Father love. Oh, God, what a gift. But, God, the real gift is Jesus. And so, God, I pray that this, our time together honored him. I pray that tomorrow as we celebrate, as we open gifts, as we meet with family as we uh, sing Christmas songs. I pray that all of it will point to Jesus, that all of it will glorify him. 
I ask this all in his name.